Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. When we talk about 19th century mental health reformers here in the U.S., one of the first names that probably comes to mind is Dorothea Dix. Dix was the superintendent of Army nurses for the Union during the Civil War, and she spent decades advocating for state-funded hospitals for people with mental illnesses and for better treatment of people in those hospitals as well as in prisons. Another reformer who was living at the same time was Elizabeth Parsons Ware Packard, who actually met Dix at one point. Dix's advocacy work started after she saw the conditions at the East Cambridge House of Corrections in Massachusetts, where she'd been asked to teach a Sunday school class. Packard's started after she was involuntarily committed to an asylum based on her husband's determination that she was, in the language of the time, insane. Packard met Dix while hospitalized. We are going to talk about Packard's story over the next two episodes, and today the focus is really on Packard and her husband and how their marriage progressed from one that was apparently happy to one that was just crumbling and ultimately abusive. Um, We don't talk as much about the mental health treatment and mental health reform in today's episode as we will next time, but some of the language that comes up is not language we would, like, we wouldn't typically just describe a person as insane today without other context, but, like, that is the word that was commonly used in her writing and his writing and in the conversation at the time. Elizabeth Packard was born Elizabeth Parsons Ware on December 28, 1816, in Ware, Massachusetts. She was the oldest surviving child of the Reverend Samuel Ware, who was a Congregationalist pastor. She also had two younger brothers. The Wares were a middle-class family, and Elizabeth was given a classical education along with her brothers. The family moved to Amherst in 1826, and Elizabeth went on to attend the Amherst Female Seminary. Female seminaries were schools meant to provide women with the same higher education that was available to men, so they were focused on academics rather than being focused on becoming good homemakers and wives. Part of Elizabeth's religious experience was the Calvinist idea of conversion. Conversion is not, of course, unique to Calvinism, but Elizabeth's family and church community were Calvinist. Even if a person had been baptized and attended church regularly, they weren't considered truly a member until after experiencing a religious conversion and publicly professing their faith. Elizabeth's conversion happened at a revival in 1831, but she really had some doubts about it. Conversion was rooted in a sense of public repentance and salvation from sin, but Elizabeth just didn't think of herself as all that sinful. In her words, she, quote, always had been doing as well as I knew how to do. She felt as though she had repented for her sins as they happened, rather than waiting for a conversion experience to do it. She feared that her conversion was just something that was expected of her and not something that she genuinely felt, This process of thinking through her own religious experience in ways that contradicted her religious community was something that she would do for the rest of her life. Elizabeth became principal of Randolph Academy in West Randolph, Massachusetts, after she finished her studies at Amherst Female Seminary. But just after her 19th birthday, her career was interrupted by what was described as brain fever. This was kind of a catch-all term for illnesses with symptoms like a high fever, sensitivity to light and sound, headache, and an excited or agitated mind. It might be applied to real conditions like encephalitis, meningitis, and migraines, but it was also a diagnosis given to supposedly overexcited or overexerted women. Elizabeth's family called in a doctor, but she didn't improve right away. So on January 27, 1836, her father had her admitted at the Worcester Hospital for the Insane. According to her patient records, her father suspected that the problem was that her corsets were laced too tightly and that her work as a teacher was causing, quote, too much mental effort. Her doctor, Dr. Samuel B. Woodward, described Elizabeth as being calm, 
at some times and mentally excited at other times. He also said that she had sores and amenorrhea or missed menstrual periods. He prescribed a range of treatments, including Epsom salts and tincture of opium for her pain. He also gave her the Griffiths mixture, which included myrrh and was used to treat chlorosis, a.k.a. green sickness, which we talked about in our episode on the green children of Woolpit. That was one of those diseases that, for some reason, only women got. Within a few weeks, though, Elizabeth seemed to be well. Her doctor described her as, quote, at all times, now very pleasant, and he discharged her as cured on March 18th of 1836. Elizabeth's own opinion on all this was that her condition had been caused by the initial treatment that she was given for brain fever and that she simply improved with time. The whole experience didn't leave her with a very good opinion of conventional medicine or of asylums. She was also profoundly embarrassed by it and angry at her father for taking her to an asylum. In the 19th century, it was very easy for women to be labeled as hysterical or insane. And once people thought of you that way, that impression tended to stick. It's not exactly a tendency that has vanished. (laughs) Nope. If people decide you're shrill or hysterical, you still are, no matter how you behave later. On May 21st, 1839, Elizabeth married Theophilus Packer Jr. of Shelburne, Massachusetts. Theophilus was born on February 1st, 1802. He was educated through tutors and schools and through his father's religious instruction. Theophilus Sr. was a Congregationalist minister. The younger Theophilus spent some time as a teacher at the age of 15, but he found that he did not really have the patience for it. Theophilus started college when he was 15 as well, although he was chronically ill, so his studies were often interrupted by health issues. Although his father was the pastor at a well-established church, Theophilus was one of eight children, so money could be tight. And at times, Theophilus had to take a break from school so that the family could afford tuition for his younger brother. Like his future wife, Theophilus had some ambivalence about his own conversion. He went to a series of revival meetings starting in 1819, but he never really felt the sense of conviction that he needed to. He finally converted in 1823 and started studying to become a minister like his father. Unlike the elder Theophilus, he never finished a divinity degree, but he did join his father as co-pastor of Shelburne Congregational Church in 1828. When Theophilus married Elizabeth, he was 37 and she was 22. Despite their age difference, they both had similar backgrounds. Both their fathers were Congregationalist ministers. They were both educated and well-read. They both opposed slavery, and they both wanted to start a family. It wasn't really a love match, though. Their temperaments were very different. Elizabeth was lively and a little unconventional, and Theophilus was very sober and reserved. In their journals and their writings about their early married life, Elizabeth proudly and sometimes effusively talked about their home and their children and the clothes that she made for them, and she did it in a very personal way. Theophilus, on the other hand, was very practical and analytical, and he detailed things like the fact that he got married and their household expenses and all these other mundane matters without a lot of emotion involved. Elizabeth had lots of suitors who were closer to her age, and she seems to have married Theophilus mostly to please her father. The two men were longtime associates, and Theophilus had known her since she was 10 years old. Theophilus, for his part, seems to have married her because he was an established pastor, and it was simply time for him to have a wife. In spite of all these differences, though, for the next 15 years, their relationship seems to have been fine. They were financially comfortable with a nice house on six acres of land with an orchard. Elizabeth filled the role of a minister's wife well, helping out in the community and teaching Sunday school and generally being an upstanding example. She was a good housekeeper and a good host when other ministers visited them. They had a child every two or three years. Another Theophilus born in 1842, Isaac, known as Ira, in 1844, Samuel in 1847, Elizabeth, known as Libby, in 1850, and George in 1853. These were both devoted parents, with Elizabeth raising the children and Theophilus seeing to their religious instruction. And their life suddenly changed in December of 1853, and we'll get into that after we first pause for a sponsor break. In December of 1853, Theophilus Packard Jr. abruptly resigned as co-pastor of his Congregationalist Church in Shelburne, Massachusetts. 
The congregation tried to get him to stay. Since his father was in his 80s by this point, it was clear that the church was going to need entirely new leadership if the younger Theophilus left. He refused to stay, though, and the family packed up to move west. Neither Theophilus nor Elizabeth really documented their reasons for his resignation or their move. But there were several probable contributing factors. Theophilus may have thought a move would be good for his health. He continued to have chronic illnesses throughout his life. He had also always had some interest in doing missionary work, which he might pursue out west. And Elizabeth was excited about the idea of a new adventure and a change of scenery. Apart from that, though, the religious environment of New England was changing. The Presbyterian Church, which had a lot of connections to the Congregationalist, was in the middle of a schism between the old school and the new school. The old school preferred very strict traditional Calvinism, while the new school wanted to revise various parts of the doctrine and was influenced by the revivalism of the Second Great Awakening. Theophilus firmly belonged to the old school, while a lot of New England's Presbyterians were beginning to favor the new school. Calvinism in general was also starting to fall out of favor, with Unitarian, Methodist, and Baptist churches becoming more popular. Theophilus seems to have thought that if he went west, away from all these new influences, he might be able to establish a church that was more in line with his traditional Calvinist views. It also meant that he could get his wife away from what he regarded as the corrupting influence of all these new denominations and unconventional doctrines. She was becoming interested in transcendentalism and had started learning about Unitarianism, something that Theophilus really wanted to discourage, not just for her, but also for how she raised their children. After they went west, they spent a few years living in parts of Ohio and Iowa, moving every year or two. Theophilus was immediately dissatisfied, though. He learned really quickly that a lot of people had moved west to get away from religious conservatism, and so he did not suddenly find himself with a thriving congregation of people to lead who really wanted to be in, like, a really old-school conservative (laughs) Calvinist church. People were also suspicious of him, especially because he was a northerner, and a lot of people who had migrated to the areas where they were living hailed from the south. Plus, Elizabeth discovered that she loved being away from New England's very strict social expectations. She could be more relaxed in her clothes and her demeanor, and she relished all the new ideas and experiences that she was discovering. She wrote, quote, Our New England habits have been broken up. Our mold in which we were cast has been broken up. We have had room for expansive growth. We were two conservative rut thinkers there. She was obviously very happy about this, but (laughs) Theophilus' assessment of all of this was that his wife was, quote, unfavorably affected by the tone of society and zealously espoused almost all new notions and wild vagaries that came along. So Theophilus had moved west with the hope of establishing a conservative church and distancing his wife from all these new modes of religious and spiritual thought. And instead, the opposite was happening. She made friends with phrenologists, and she invited Unitarian ministers to stay with them, and she started adopting spiritualist beliefs. Soon their marriage was really starting to show some strain. Elizabeth wanted, in her words, a manly man who would love her and support her. She increasingly followed the idea known as new womanhood, that a woman should be pious, pure, domestic, and submissive, with the household and the child-rearing matters falling under her sphere of influence. Theophilus, on the other hand, thought his authority was the foundation of their marriage and that Elizabeth should submit to it in all things. He was fine with her making decisions about the home and the children as long as they were the same as what he wanted her to do. Elizabeth was also aware of the growing movement for women's rights, and she found other like-minded people wherever she lived. They encouraged her to stand up for herself and make her opinions known to her husband. She did more and more missionary work out in the community, even though her husband thought she was neglecting their home to do it. Theophilus was frustrated and dismayed by this sudden, to his mind, lack of obedience and femininity in his wife. On top of all that, the family started having financial trouble thanks to their series of relocations and remodeling the houses that they moved into and the fact that their congregations were just a lot smaller and less affluent than they had been back east. 
Eventually, the Packards moved to Mantino, Illinois, where Theophilus's sister lived with her husband, Abijah Dole. Theophilus became pastor at Mantino's First Presbyterian Church. Very shortly after the move, before they were really even settled in, Elizabeth went to New York with their two youngest children to visit family. At this point, Elizabeth seems to have really genuinely needed a break after all this moving around and financial troubles and her increasingly contentious marriage. She was trying to maintain a home and take care of five children without a lot of help. She was increasingly frustrated by her husband's lack of support for her and her opinions, and he had started to imply to her that he didn't think she was in her right mind, and the fact that he was saying this to her really frightened and upset her. Elizabeth described herself as being at her breaking point. She wrote that she was, quote, seeking what my soul needed but could not find at home, the love and sympathy of friends. But when she got to New York, she learned that her husband had written to her family ahead of her trip and told them that he thought she was, in the language of the day, insane. In New York, Elizabeth spent a lot of time with women's rights activists and spiritualists. She went to several seances, and at one of them, a medium gave her a message from her late mother, Lucy Strong Parsons Ware, who told her to prepare for persecution. In addition to her belief in seances and spirit communication, all of which were totally common among spiritualists, but bizarre to Calvinists. Elizabeth came to think of the Holy Ghost as female and to believe that at some point there would be a human incarnation of God who was a woman. While she was in New York, Elizabeth also became connected to a man named Abner Baker. He was a Swedenborgian, and they connected over matters of religion and spirituality. They had an emotional affair, carried out through letters. Elizabeth justified this to herself by calling it a, quote, harmonial marriage, and something that was totally distinct from her marriage to her husband. She described it this way, quote, Can the thirsty, famishing soul help loving the pure cold water? Neither can I help loving a pure man. We'll get to what happened after Elizabeth got back to Illinois after a sponsor break. Elizabeth returned from New York to Illinois in the early March of 1858. And on December 18th of that year, she gave birth to her last child, Arthur. It doesn't appear that anybody questioned Arthur's paternity, and it's also not totally clear whether Elizabeth's relationship with Abner was physical. She did keep writing to him after she got home, though, something that Theophilus eventually discovered after finding their letters. Not long after Arthur's birth, Theophilus also went back east for about a month, and he again convinced her family that she was mentally ill, something they did not think was the case after her visit with them. Theophilus's church in Mantino was struggling. It was small, and it had only been in existence for four years when he became the pastor there. At the beginning of his time there, it didn't have a permanent meeting place, so the congregation assembled at various schools, as well as at the Mantino Methodist Church. Meanwhile, as her husband was struggling with this pretty small and not really established congregation, Elizabeth was talking publicly about her views on religion— something that her husband found embarrassing and unacceptable because what she was saying so often contradicted what he was saying from the pulpit. And many of these things that she was talking about to Calvinists were heretical and dangerous. Theophilus' brother-in-law, Abijah Dole, was also a deacon at this church, and he eventually asked Elizabeth if she would talk about her ideas in his Bible class. His motivation seems to have been that if he let her do this, people would see that what she was saying was heretical nonsense and just conclude that she was not in her right mind. The class had six members when she started her discussions, but before long, it had picked up to about 40 new members. Soon, Theophilus and Abijah thought Elizabeth's Bible class discussions were really dangerous. They were having the opposite effect of what they thought might happen when they let her do it. Like we said earlier, in the minds of a lot of Calvinists, a lot of what she was talking about was heresy, even though in other circles they were all totally normal ideas. Even if it wasn't strictly heretical, it was really more connected to her own experiences and her intuition than it was to formal church doctrine that Theophilus thought they should really be focusing on. So, after a while, Theophilus demanded that she stop doing these Bible class discussions. I love that these dudes are, like, forever, like, trying to come up with ways to manage and control her, and every time it backfires, it's like, nope. Yeah. 
Not so much. Uh, Elizabeth really wanted her husband's support in this, and she told him that he should go into the church and say, quote, My wife has just as good a right to her opinions as you have to yours, and I shall protect her in that right. And when he refused to back her up, she asked the church to release her from her membership so that she could join the Methodist church instead, and her husband's church refused. Having been raised Methodist, I'm like, why would you go to the Methodists, though? Like, they, <laughs> they would not really have been into all of your spirituality and uh, and for no- maybe phrenology, but, like, not so much you're going to a medium and having seances right. and talking to your late mother. It may have just seemed like the more permissive option to Calvinists at the time, right? It's, yeah. I, it's, like, not not perfect, but better than what I've currently got going on. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I also don't know if any of the even more um, liberal uh, denominations had a church there at that point. I maybe. Um, so at this point, Theophilus had been implying or outright saying that he thought his wife was insane for quite some time, including convincing her family that she wasn't well. Elizabeth really started to fear that her husband was going to try to institutionalize her, so she arranged with one of her oldest sons that he would protect her personal papers if something happened to her. Meanwhile, Theophilus started gathering all kinds of statements from church members and doctors attesting to their opinion that Elizabeth was not well and needed to be committed. On May 24, 1860, he also got 15 members of their church to sign a letter condemning her opinions and behavior and urging her to repent. Yeah, so he was basically building a case that his wife was not sane, but he didn't actually need to do all this to have her committed. In 1851, Illinois had amended an earlier law which had established mental hospitals, and this amendment, at least in theory, was to protect married women. Before the amendment was passed, if a person was going to be committed, a jury had to find that there was cause to do so. But with this new amendment, a married woman, quote, who in the judgment of the medical superintendent are evidently insane or distracted, may be received and detained in the hospital on the request of the husband without the evidence of insanity or distraction required in other cases. In other words, if a husband asked and the medical superintendent of a hospital judged that his wife was insane or distracted, she could be committed with no further investigation or evaluation into her mental state and without taking her feelings or wishes into account at all. So the men who crafted this law did so with the idea that it would protect married women from the indignity and shame of a public trial about their sanity. In reality, though, it made it possible for husbands to have their wives committed with very little effort or process and very little to protect married women from being committed without cause. All Theophilus needed to do was get letters from two doctors who agreed with him about his wife's mental state. There were plenty of people in town who genuinely did believe that Elizabeth's religious opinions and behavior were evidence of a mental illness, so this was not difficult to do. There were certainly also plenty of people who just wanted her to shut up. Ultimately, she was forcibly committed, and here is how she described it. Quote, Early on the morning of the 18th of June, 1860, as I arose from my bed preparing to take my morning bath, I saw my husband approaching my door with our two physicians, both members of his church and of our Bible class, and a stranger gentleman, Sheriff Burgess. Fearing exposure, I hastily locked my door and proceeded with the greatest dispatch to dress myself. Before I had hardly commenced, my husband forced an entrance into my room through the window with an axe, and I, for shelter and protection against exposure in a state of almost entire nudity, sprang into bed just in time to receive my unexpected guests. The trio approached my bed, and each doctor felt my pulse, and without asking a single question, both pronounced me insane. According to her husband, the doctors were not there to assess her mental state. Those assessments had already been done, and the decision had been made. Instead, he said they were there to determine whether she could safely travel all the way to the hospital, which was in Jacksonville, Illinois, 200 miles or about 320 kilometers away. Elizabeth's account continues, quote, I was soon in the hands of the sheriff who forced me from my home by ordering two men to carry me to the wagon, which took me to the depot. 
Esquire Labrie, our nearest neighbor who witnessed this scene, said he was willing to testify before any court under oath that Mrs. Packard was literally kidnapped. I was carried to the cars from the depot in the arms of two strong men whom my husband appointed for this purpose amid the silent and almost speechless gaze of a large crowd of citizens who had collected for the purpose of rescuing me from the hands of my persecutors. Elizabeth was admitted to the Illinois State Asylum and Hospital for the Insane. Her children at this point were between the ages of 2 and 18, and it would be three years before she saw most of them again. So next time, we will talk about Elizabeth's time in the hospital and her advocacy work that went on after she was discharged. I have this moment when we're talking about particularly this last part of the story with the husband, you know, coming in through a window with an axe, and I'm like... Who who is the person who has some problems going on here? Right, <laughs> right. Well, we're going to talk about this more next time. Um, but but one of the things that uh, that I read a um, biography of her and like an account of this whole situation called Elizabeth Packard: A Noble Fight by Linda B. Carlisle. As I was researching this, and one of the points that she makes was that. Okay, obviously this this involuntary commitment, like this is a whole problem. She had no due process. She had no protection. It was just like her her husband and the doctor deciding this and forcibly removing her. Um, but if you look at both of their writing as their marriage was falling apart, they both needed a break and like some treatment. Yeah. <laughs> like they, they were obviously both falling apart and they were living in a society that did not even think of things like therapy. Like that wasn't even right. really an idea yet, but it was like uh, apart from the the idea of like a mental illness that would require inpatient treatment to be successfully managed or or uh, treated in some way. Like, there's just the fact that, like, that they needed some care, both of them, that they were not getting. So, <laughs> after that infuriating last interlude of this story, I have some, I think, uh, less infuriating, not infuriating at all, <laughs> listener mail. I'm like, how much less infuriating? <laughs> So this is from Steve. It is about our uh, our Chester A. Arthur birthplace episode. And this is one of several um, emails and tweets and Facebook comments that we got on the subject. So I just picked one of them. This is from Steve. Steve says, hi there. Always enjoy the show and just had a question on your latest podcast. You mentioned that Chester A. Arthur had romantic relationships with two men while he was a teacher. I tried to find more information about that but couldn't find anything. I'd like to read more about it if you have a reference for that information. Thanks for your time and no worries if it's too much trouble to find Steve. Thank you, Steve. That is not too much trouble at all. So what we had said in that episode was that Chester A. Arthur had romantic friendships with two other young men while he was, uh, at, like, in his early teaching career. Um, and I think we've talked about romantic friendships on the show before. These were friendships, uh, generally between people of the same gender, that tended to be, like, more emotive and passionate than we often think of in terms of platonic friendships today. Um, and it was not, it was just something that was regarded as just a normal part of life and not really something that needed additional commentary or uh, not really viewed as um, socially questionable in any way. It's clear if you look at historical accounts that some people who were outwardly fitting into this idea of a romantic friendship were really a couple, but a lot of it was more like people who wrote each other really, really passionate, affectionate letters or spooned while they were sleeping or maybe were physically affectionate with each other in a way that today might more signify that they were a couple, but at the time signified that they were friends, not really having like a romantic or sexual partnership. There is, in the presidential podcast from the Washington Post, a quote from one of the letters that he wrote to his friend uh, Campbell Allen, um, which is just very affectionate. And the other uh, source that was a, like a more substantive discussion of it was one of the sources from the episode that was Scott Greenberger's The Unexpected President, The Life and Times of Chester A. Arthur. Um, but a lot of the papers 
that discussed Chester A. Arthur in general or this whole thing about his birthplace make sort of a passing reference to these very uh, romantic letters that he wrote to a couple of other men when he was a young man. And um, and so it's one of those things that, like, comes up a lot. The letters themselves are in the Library of Congress. So that is that explanation regarding romantic friendships. Um, like we said, like, if you look at the whole arc of LGBTQ history, uh, there are clearly folks in that t- same time period who uh, were, like, in love with each other and were a a romantic couple and were maybe able to fly under the radar with it by uh, the fact that these friendships were regarded as totally normal. But if folks had known that it went beyond that, there would have been a lot more stigma. So that's that. If you would like to write to us about this or any other podcast, we're at History Podcast at HowStuffWorks.com. And then we're all over social media at Miss in History. That's where you'll find our Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. If you come to our website, which is MissedInHistory.com, you can find show notes for all the episodes that Holly and I have ever worked on and a searchable archive of every episode ever. And in the main menu, where it says live shows, you can see our upcoming live shows that we're going to do. You can also subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. (laughs) 